Hello, I'm Zai. Welcome back to Tokyo Necro. Ah, just took another short break. Got myself some tea. And uh, we are back. I also drank a lot of water to prevent my throat from being too parched. And hopefully it won't be. Since this game has a shit ton of dialogue that I have to voice out. But yeah, last time we... Played as Son and Ethica. Ethica got Mitsumi to help out with rescuing Son and Iria. And Son is fighting Ikatsu right about now. While I assume, like I said, Mitsumi is probably gonna have to face out against Pavlov here. But I guess we'll see. Feeling energized, I run and gun my way through the hordes of lo fis in both hands, I'm holding assault rifles I snatch from the corpses of some SAD soldiers. She doesn't know about the scavenger, by the way, so... I wonder... Will Ethica actually die by the scavenger bullet at some point in this route? The bullets don't seem to immediately do anything to the lo fis But strangely enough, as soon as I kick them aside, they fall over and melt away like ice, ice cream on a hot summer day. Scavenger, huh? Wait, how does she know about this? Ah, oh, X-Brain. My X-Brain pulls up some info on a similar weapon from the depth of its database. Simply put, it decomposes dead flesh. That's kind of crazy though that the X-Brain would know about this stuff, right? Because Soon isn't using his X-Brain, so... It's not like Soon's X-Brain can tell Ethica's X-Brain about... The scavenger. Mitsumi makes a troubled expression. But man, I can't believe those stingy bastards at the Empire Energy Corp kept these babies to themselves. How typical. If confronted, ab confront com confronted about it, they'd probably go on about how they'll s they're still in development and too dangerous to be handed over to the public or whatever. At any rate, these scavengers sure make it easy to explore the ship. They're overpowered as all hell. I'm not even feeling any excitement for mowing down these ghouls. Still, getting through the SAD troops while trying to find Son and Iria in this labyrinth of a ship isn't exactly a cakewalk. I looked up some schematics beforehand just to be on the safe side, but it seems Amachi Juichiro made some renovations. The actual interior is pretty different compared to what I had expected. Mitsumi picks into one of the cabins and calls me over. The inside of the room is pretty barren, except for the pair of re eliminators on the floor. I was gonna drink some water, god damn it! Answer her yourself, damn you, Ethica! Sorry, that was actually drinking some water there. As Mitsumin picks up the guns, I place a hand on her shoulder. <laughs> okay, I thought. Mitsumi was gonna be facing off again against Pavlov, but color me surprised. Mitsumi's reaction comes fast as lightning. She flies out of the, out of the door without missing a beat. <laughs> Burning with righteous indignation, Mitsumi is about to launch herself at Milgram, but I hold her back. I have a really bad feeling about this. I have to muster up all my remaining willpower to stifle my anger. But I managed to do it somehow. I still remember what it was like seeing Mitsumin's undead brother back at her agency. So I totally get why she wants Milgram's head on a pike. But... <laughs> Mitsumin hesitates. There are probably a million things whirling about through her mind right, about right now. But in the end, 
She nods and takes off with Soen's real eliminators in hand. Good. And don't you look back now. You're still alive, and so is Soen. So fight for him. The living gotta stick together. I discard the SED rifles and switch over to my trusty rabbit punch. It served me well over the years. The familiar sensation of its handle in my grip is all I need to get myself fired up. Rabbit Punch roars out. I swing its blade downward, only to be stopped by Milgram's side pistol. This goddamn curder is way too tight. I won't be able to move around too much. Push forward or be pushed back. That's pretty much what this battle will come down to. There's nowhere to escape. I sense an attack. And quickly dodge backwards to evade it. Immediately afterwards, I hear a loud crash. Milgram's right arm, augmented by a high temperature superconducting motor, has crashed onto the, into the wall, leaving a massive dent in it. This is the power of, the, of his anti-armor suit, a prototype armor created by Eclipse Corp during the Sino-American War. To be used by the US Army's Special Oper Operations Group, the thing possesses speed and destructive power capable of even taking out tanks and other armored vehicles with ease. This comes at a high price though. The armor places an, enor an enormous burden on its wearer. Milgram has likely extensively augmented his body as a way to combat this. He's not quite a cyborg, but he's probably replaced most of his bones with cemented carbide, which should make him for make him far more resilient than the average person. <laughs> I yell at him with all the rage I can work up. In contrast, he calmly fires back at me with his side pistol. I get hit on the stomach a couple times, but it doesn't bother me much. Even if my bulletproof vest fails to stop a bullet, it's not like a gunshot wound is going to be anything to worry about with my undead body. I swing Rabbit Punch at Milgram with all the strength I can muster. He takes the blade head on and blocks it with his side pistol. Weapon presses against weapon with incredible power. Bright sparks spray forth. As I'm trying to my best to find a way to break this deadlock, Milgram looks at me with a calm, undisturbed gaze. gaze. He watches in response to my every move, denying me an opening. He's not just strong, but disciplined as well. Annoyingly so. But what pisses me off the most about the asshole is how in control he seems to be. Yeah, they're both working together. I briefly pull my chains chainsaw away, turn it around in my grip and launch a powerful downward swing from above. Milgram blocks it by pulling both his arms in front of his face. The deadlock breaks. Still holding on to my chainsaw, I get thrust backward down the corridor. Jesus fucking Christ! Just how strong is this guy? Try as I might, I'm not confident I can get the upper, upper hand against him like this. I finally realize why Milgram's gaze has been bothering me all this time. He's been admiring me like an art collector who's found a rare painting. All he's been doing is testing my strength without actually intending to finish me off. As someone who spent years living with Ryoko, I know more than anyone how much she still loves Ikatsu. If they could somehow be reunited, 
Milgram's next words shattered a faint glimmer of hope I still had. Thank God I stopped the, uh, you know, the recording on that, uh, on that transition. Because I, I could never stop after that. The situation has changed. I have a weapon now. One that's been specific, specifically designed for anti-living dead combat. Ikatsu's corpse may be well preserved, but that doesn't change the fact that he's dead. If I so much as land a single shot with my scavenger, all I have to do is wait 15 seconds and I win. The odds are overwhelming, overwhelmingly in my favor. Or so I thought. It soon become pain, becomes painfully clear how naive I've been. The only answer I give him is a quick burst for my rifle. He doesn't so much as flinch. He lifts up the dead body of an SAD soldier from the floor, from the floor and uses it as a shield. For, uses it to shield himself from, from my scavenger shots before ultimately hurling the corpse right at me. I nimbly duck out of the bo body's way and fire another burst at Ikatsu, who's already found himself a new corpse shield in the, mean in the meantime. Mm. All my shots end up missing him. Seemingly moving at the speed of light, he delivers a fierce body blow and follows it up with a strained punch. I get blown away, but can tell he's not done with me yet. I blindly fire off a few bullets in his general direction. If I were so, and I'd probably hit the bullet in, in like, uh, the palm of my hand or something, you know? Heck, I probably would, would like, uh, inject myself with a bullet somewhere in my body or something. And when, at some point, he probably will, like, get into close quarters with Sohn, right? He's probably gonna try to do some, some of his wrestling move or whatever. I'd get the, the bullet out of my body and then fuck him up. That's what I would do. I managed to land on the ground with relative grace, but I'm still feeling somewhat dizzy and dis disoriented. For now though, I just need to get back on my feet. Still half staggering on my feet, I continue frantically running through corridor after corridor. If he catches me, it's all over. I have two more minutes to shake off Ikatsu and make it back to the upper, upper deck. That's all I need to do. Re-eliminating him is, isn't technically necessary to... His scolding tone freezes my legs in place. He's seen right through me. For as long as I can remember, I've looked up to Ikatsu like he was a god. I don't want him to finish that sentence. I'm terrified of learning the truth. But all Ikatsu does is let out that hearty laugh of his. <laughs> what is he afraid to learn, by the way? I'm actually not sure. I could tell. Ever since I first laid up eyes upon him in that cell, Ikatsu does certainly resemble the god I used to idolize. But that's all that is. A resemblance. Ikatsu died. He's no longer my god. As Ikatsu launches a roundhouse kick at my face, the rifle I use to block it is sent flying. It hits the wall and breaks the pieces, spilling all my remaining scavenger ammo on the floor. The impact of his attack sends me to my knees. I'm stuck in a dead end, with nowhere else to run. Then again, there has never been anywhere to run. Not from him. I calmly look Ikatsu in the eye before finally posing him a question.
I finally understand how Mitsumi must have felt when she decided to live for the sake of prolonging her dead brother's unlife. I too would love to spend more time with Ikatsu. I want him to return to being the god he used to be. But the man I admired is gone. He's become nothing more than a lingering wraith of the past. I'll put down whoever stands in my way of in the way of my love, be it god or wraith. For the sake of all my comrades at the Kara Suzumi Living Dead Stalker Agency, for Hagio Iria, and most of all, for Gijo Mitsumi. Yeah, see, this is for sure her route. Because like I said, no way my friend would lie that he got Iria's route by having both Son and Ethica alive, right? <coughs> Our fists clash. But I end up getting effortlessly blown back. Compared to his muscular arms, mine are like that of a child. Unsurprisingly, he uses this opportunity to throw himself at me. My former god used to put me through this week after week. He'd pound me into the ground with incredible force. And that'd be that. Game, set, match. <laughs> my vision blurs as he left his left... As his left fist crashes into my face. <laughs> I nearly black out as he drives his right fist into me. <laughs> then comes another left hook. And I can feel the very strength drained from my body. <laughs> his right fist doesn't hit me. <clears throat> Ikatsu watches in shock as his right hand dissolves into a dark, slimy liquid. When our fists clashed together earlier, I had one of the scavenger bullets from the floor hidden between my fingers. Da that's my son. That's what I would have done myself. But like I said, I probably would have put it inside of my body. The bacteria ate into his exposed flesh, and now it's begun to rapidly consume him. Ikatsu's visible dismay is proof that his emotions haven't completely faded just yet. I perform a bridge to free myself and start running down the hallway, though not with a, dec a decent bit of hesitation. I spot a nearby SAD course with a handgun. If I'm to buy myself another 15 seconds, I'm going to need something with ro enough raw stopping power. A purpose this handgun should serve admirably enough. I snatch the gun off the corpse and promptly aim it at, at Ikatsu. However, what happens next defies all my expectations. Mm. Yeah, I knew it. He's gonna rip his arm away, right? Ikatsu grabs onto his partially discolored right arm. <laughs> the reason I know he was gonna do this is because this exact thing happened to Ethica. Or, you know, like Sophia actually asked Ethica to cut his ar her arm. And tears it clean off. I watch in horror as dusky red, red, red blood sprays out in, in a white arc, splashing onto the nearby wall. <laughs> His discarded right arm is quickly dissolved by the scavenger. Sorry about that, Ikatsu. Plunging himself back into the battle, Ikatsu flashes a wolfish grin. It almost seems as if he's ridiculing himself for having forgotten even Ryoko. I consider the time I still have left. It doesn't seem like I'll be able to keep my promise to Iria. The same way we've trained ourselves to be experts of anti-living dead warfare, Milgram has specialized himself in fighting living dead stalkers like us. The bastard's fucking fast. I slash at him with rabbit punch to try and get the upper hand, but he effortlessly blocks it. The superconducting motor of his suit propels his arm into my chest at the speed of light. God, he's not letting up! Rabbit punch lies near my feet after having been blown, blown out of my grip. An idea hits me. Here goes nothing. Stretching my leg as far as I can, I hook my foot on the chainsaw's handle and send it flying toward Milgram with a kick. This makes him retreat and put some distance between us. Good thing I used to dabble in capoeira back in the day. Didn't expect it to come in, ha come in handy at a time like this. Having said that, I'm not doing too hot all in all. Milgram fights like a pro, but I should be able to put up a better fight than this. Could it be that... <laughs> Could it be that... 
God, I wish this fucker would just quit his yapping already. I fire myself up as much as I can, but a part of me knows it's just an act. Milgram's probably right. I don't react to my X brain as fast as I used to. What took me 0.1 seconds yesterday is now taking me 0.2. My senses have dulled, and I no longer respond to threats the same way. In battle, that's enough to cost you your life. But what about freaking Ikatsu? This is why I feel like that's... Some stuff is a bit too convenient for the sake of, you know, the plot, right? For Son, it was actually love. His non-stop blabbering pisses me off to no end. Or at least, I think it does. It should. My chainsaw gets deflected with a sharp twack and is sent flying across the corridor. Milgram then immediately slaps one of, side, one of his side pit pistols into my foot, pinning it to the ground. His other one aims for my jaw. If he fires now, he's gonna blow my brains out. Suddenly, we're interrupted by the sound of several pairs of approaching footsteps. Is SAD on their way here? Milgram's fingers reach for, reaches for the trigger of his side pistol. Oh, I see how it is. This entire battle was just an amusing little distraction for him until Day came back. Okay, fine. Then I might as well... Pull out all the stops now! Who's they? The blade that shoots out, from my, out of my left hand is made of ultra-high purity steel. It's more than capable of drilling right into the side of Milgram's anti-armor suit. How you like them apples, huh? This bath boy here is my latest acquisition. A magnetic whip. Implanting weapons into a living person is a risky proposition. No matter how advanced our technology may be, merging mechanical parts into a living organism requires utmost skill and precision. Here's the thing though, I'm already dead. The surgery needed to implant old Baldi's magnetic whip into my arm took no more than an hour. All that's left is to see how it performs in life combat. Looks like it's doing its job just fine. Milgram's wound is deep enough that not even his nanomachines can treat it in time. Good. I wouldn't expect any less from the weapon that took me out. <laughs> As Milgram uttered those words, my magnetic whip sizzles to life. The rage that burns in my chest continues to weaken with every passing minute. But I'll make sure to use the weapon that killed me to pay this bastard back in full. Suddenly, the whole world erupts. What the heck happened? Come on, man! This game really likes doing shit like this. I hate it! He promised her. Someone gave his word that he'd catch up to her. Iria attempts to stay calm by reminding herself to, to that fact. It's what keeps her going. <laughs> Sensing someone's presence, Iria stops in her tracks. She could swear she caught a brief glimpse of someone familiar down that, that corridor. <laughs> Yamanuma grabs Iria by the hand and forces her onward. His combat armor is painted green and white, the colors of the Empire Energy Corps Special Activities Division. Iria has no reason to trust him. Her instincts tell her not to. She only obeys him because of Son. After blacking out at the fortress and waking up in a cell, Iria has come to the conclusion that the only person she can still trust is Son. What about Ethica? Tokitaka or Ryoko. As the hatch opens and she climbs up top, Iria sees a deck covered in white, black and red. The corpses of the SAD soldiers have all melted into pools of slimy, dead flesh, making it difficult to tell where one body ends and another begins. 
気にするなお前の能力の価値は彼らの命とは比べ物にならない<笑> Iria glares at Yamanuma but he pays it no mind and continues pulling her across the deck toward a gunship painted in the colors of the Empire Energy Corp. Nore. Matte. Mata jikan ga aru. Kiken da. Yakusoku shita no? Hmm? After spending a few moments in thought, Yamanuma orders his men to stand watch. He uses his conry to pull up a hologram with a one minute count countdown. Damn this guy. Iria continues to wait. She stands perfectly still, watching as the falling snow melts into the dusky red puddles littering the deck. She remembers the night she drowsily listened to Soen talk about his former mentor and, a, and personal god. Sometime later, Iria used her Kanri to look up a picture of Karasuzumi Ikatsu while he was still alive. It was the same man Soen faced down in that armory. I'll catch up to you. Soen sounded like he didn't even believe those words himself. Iria can only pray for his safety. And for him to make it back in time. She prays for them both to make it off the ship alive and continue their lives at the Kara Suzumi living at Stalker Agency, Iria's new home. However, <laughs> Iria can tell he's not just bluffing, but she doesn't want to abandon hope, not until the very last moment. She can't allow herself to get too worked up. That would only lead to Yamanuma knocking her out and dragging her away. So despite herself, she obediently climbs onto the gunship. Once aboard the gunship, Iria can no longer see the outside. The SAD soldiers no doubt still continue to monitor the perimeter through a camera feed sent to either their helmets or retinas. But Iria hasn't been granted access to anything of the sort. She feels the gunship slowly lift off the ground. All she can do is hope and pray that Son will make it back safe and sound. Against all odds, she still believes he'll catch up to her. <laughs> you know that they're gonna bomb the ship, right? When a distant explosion rocks the hull of the gunship, Iria springs to her feet almost immediately. She forces herself past the SED soldiers and makes her way to the cockpit to look outside. She almost doesn't want to believe her eyes. In the falling snow, Iria sees a thick pillar of smoke billow up upwards from the amphibious assault ship. Its massive hull has broken in half and begun to sink into the ocean. We're not gonna die that easily, Iria. An explosion rocks the corridor immediately after Ikatsu has torn off his own right arm. It doesn't entirely catch me by surprise though. Yamanuma did say they'd be recommending their attack on a ship once Iria was in their custody. Recommencing. The fact I've managed to avoid being caught in the blast itself may also may have also been this way of being considerate. Ignoring the visibly perplexed Ikachu, Ikatsu, I swiftly make my way down the, un the unsteady corridor. The ship is surrounded by the freezing waters of the ocean. And although I do possess an internal oxygen circulation device, and an above average resistance to cold, they both have their limits. Trying to swim ashore in below freezing temperatures doesn't sound like something I'd be able to pull off. I don't even know how close we are to land. SAD probably considers me to be expendable. The floor has tilted to a dangerous angle, making the water reach up to my feet. With the emergency lights offering only a meager semblance of illumination to the curder, the surface of the water seems almost like an entrance to hell itself. I turn back toward the bow of the ship, but when I do... Ikatsu rushes me down and grabs me by the arm. He throws me like a ragdoll, sending my body crashing against some of the some of the nearby pipes. There's Ikatsu in front of me, and a freezing ocean on, to my back. I instinctively throw myself through the closest open, open door I see. I find myself in an engine room that's been completely torn asunder, with thick smoke rising from the, from the turbines. The bottom has been blown open, and the surrounding passages are rapidly sinking into the water. 
It's like a scene straight out of, out of a nightmare. If I can make it to an upper floor, that should lead me back to the deck. Provided I'm fast enough, the gunship might still be there. The graded floor I step on, the, on is wet with seawater. I grip onto the discolored handrails and take the stairs to the floor above. When I arrive, the ground trembles below my feet. Ikatsu has torn up the floor, effectively robbing me of my footing. With my balance disrupted, I make an attempt to leap toward the next door. Using a still burning turbine as a foothold, Ikatsu jumps up and latches onto my feet. The freezing seawater continues to rise from below. I do all I can to hold onto the door, but Ikatsu is too heavy. When he was alive, he claimed that an over-alliance on machines will prevent you from unleashing your full potential in times of emergency, which is why he had no implants of his own. However, he's a living dead now. It makes sense that his body would be heavily modified to make him just as powerful, if not more so than he, w than he was in life. I can't keep holding on like this with him weighing me down. He uses his left hand to drag me down and we both plunge into the, into the dark, icy depths below. Damn, underwater... battle? The railguns that tore the ship in half have done an immense amount of damage. I reach out and try to grab so onto something, but it's all too late. With Akatsu dragging me down, I sink deeper and deeper into the ocean through the ship's open belly. If memory serves, there's an oceanic trench near Tokyo Bay that's over 500 meters in depth. We might have drifted into that. My internal oxygen circulation device alone won't be able to maintain my body temperature. If we sink too deep, I'm done for. I struggle to free myself from Mikatsu, but he traps me with his muscular legs. Told you you should have put a scavenger inside one of your body parts, man. His strength is nothing short of inhuman. The sole sliver of light in this situation is that he only has one arm left. If he still had both, he could have simply shattered my limbs and that would, be, that would have been the end of it. I launch a desperate attempt to free myself from Mikatsu's legs and take some distance from him. If I can manage that, he won't be able to catch up due to being weighed down by his many implants. However, Ikasu continues to prove a formidable, formidable opponent, even with just one arm. Holding me in a tight grip with his arms and legs, arm and legs, he skillfully maneuvers behind my back and attempts to apply pressure to my carted ar artery as a way to choke me out. We sink deeper and deeper, but I'm not done yet. I muster up all the strength I have left to attempt to shake him off and make it back to the surface. Thankfully, my internal oxygen circulation device is still active. But the fact that I feel like I'm on the verge of suffocating is a clear indication that my time is short. The tiny stream of air bubbles that leak forth from my lips mingle with the metallic debris drifting downward through the water. The light continues to fade as the dark, deep void of the abyss envelops us both. Yeah, see? If I was not in a very impatient... Like, uh... You know, impatient, um... If I wasn't very impatient right now, I wouldn't be saying that sentence as fast as I did. God damn it. Impatient state of mind, there we go, that was the word I was looking for. Ikatsu's grip remains strong and firm. His body is, is ice. It no longer needs warmth. His dark eyes beckon me to join him in death. As the already icy waters become colder and colder, I can feel myself gradually fading. My imminent demise draws nearer, and nearer. When suddenly, a flash of light illuminates the endlessly distant surface of the, of the ocean. I cling onto the hope it symbolizes. I thought you couldn't swim. She descends upon me like an angel of salvation. Holding onto a massive metallic motor, Dijo Mitsumi comes chasing after us with the, speed of a, with the speed of a bullet. I use every last fiber of my being to reach out toward her. As my fingers lightly graze hers, 
I feel like I can sense the very beating of her heart. She hands me one of my trusty real eliminators. Its familiar, comforting grip fills me with courage. Meanwhile, Ikatsu is still trying to strangle me from behind. I use my freshly reg regained weapon to aim for his left shoulder. And pull the trigger. Should have just shot his head, man. The shots send shockwaves through the water, followed by a powerful current. And streaks of dusky red blood. Once I'm freed, I immediately spin my body around. Ikatsu makes a last ditch effort to grab me, but he's too far away. The man I once looked up to as a god slowly and irreversibly drifts away into the darkness. Mitsumi hands me my other re-eliminator. I fire another two shots at Ikatsu, and I'm fairly certain that I've hit him. My vision is flooded with white, however, making it impossible to tell whether or not I landed a, he a headshot. Soon enough, his body, along with the streaks of dusky red blood drifting along in the water, vanish from view entirely. I know I should chase after him to confirm his death. But an odd, unsettling feeling compels me to turn around. I see Mitsumi floating limp in the water, her eyes growing dimmer with each passing second. She can't swim, damn it. At first, I didn't realize what had happened. There was a sudden white light followed by a loud explosion that sent me crashing into the ground, the ceiling, the walls, and God knows where else. I managed to shield my head, but the same can't be said about the rest of my body. If I wasn't a living dead, I probably wouldn't have survived that. When I finally came to, I'm lying on the floor. The lights are out too. I strain my eyes and see... The low, rumbling creaks I hear in the distance sound almost like the dying whales of the ship. I can only assume this is the Empire Energy Corps' handiwork. I even out my breathing and take a quick look around. The only source of light in the corridor comes from the emergency lamps, and it's not much. Milgram's nowhere to be seen, as far as I can tell. What I do see is the dark, muddy surface of the water beyond that ruined passageway. Nothing else. Did the bastard get blown to pieces by the explosion? Or did he sink to the bottom of, bottom of the ocean? Either way, he's done for. But man, I can't believe all this happened right as we were getting to the best part. Anyway, I need to get my shit together. I have Sona Neria to worry about. <coughs> I attempt to stand up, but notice that my right leg is broken. With only the distant groans of the ship to keep me company, I struggle to my feet and shuffle off in search of the upper, of the upper deck. The ship has tilted to the side quite a bit. Fat streaks of dark smoke billow up into the cold winter sky. It's still less than a minute since that explosion, so the ship hasn't completely sunk yet. Unfortunately, I can't make out our submarine in the turbulent, foamy waters below. This ain't good. Even if Misumin manages to save so in an area, it won't mean much if we're stuck out here. What's more, all the stray bullets from the SAD's fight with the living dead punctured a bunch of the, lo of the lifeboats. I gotta find one that hasn't been damaged, and do it fast. Up in the smoke cloud in the skies, I can make out an approaching gunship. God damn things louder than a lawn lawnmower. Even with my busted... Even with my busted leg, I see that typo. I managed to ready my chainsaw for whatever might go down. The Empire Energy Corp may not ha have hostile intentions toward us, but we're not exactly buddy-buddy either. They are the ones trying to sink the ship with us still on it. I wouldn't put it past them to start firing that chain gun the moment they see me. Not letting my guard down, I use my hollow glasses to zoom in on the gunship. On the gunship. <gasps> She stands next to the pilot, while pointing a gun to her own head. <laughs> wow, what the fuck? The gunship slowly begins to ascend toward the edge of the house-sunk ship. As its cargo holds open, a wire rope 
gets lowered down in my direction. The voice comes from a man in what I must assume is an SAD uniform. I check my body real quick and make sure that my synthetic spider silk underclothes are hiding the heinous injuries I've suffered. As for the blotches of dus dusky red blood, I can easily explain this away as belonging to all the living dead I've killed. So they should, shouldn't be able to immediately figure out that I'm a hi-fi that I'm a hi-fi myself. Long story short, they probably won't ship me on site. Probably. <laughs> Dragging my broken leg along, I force my way past the SED soldiers and reach Iria, who's still holding the gun in her hand. <laughs> I attempt to lighten the mood, but Iria's expression clouds over. Ooh, sorry about that. Thought she was then. I give her a reassuring pat on the head. Iria understands just how important she is to, SA to the SAD, which is why she essentially took herself hostage and forced them to come look for us. The gun Iria is holding belongs to the Empire Energy Corp. She likely snatched it from a soldier when they weren't looking, but upon closer inspection, I noticed that the gun's safety is still on. The SAD soldiers must have realized it as well. I take the gun from Iria and turn to look at the man who lowered the rope for me. Sporting a rapier, rapier glare, he gazes out at the ocean through the open door of the gunship. For some reason, I don't believe that, Ethica. Milgram's anti-armor suit weighs a ton, to speak nothing of the multiple augmentations in his body. If he did fall into those icy waters, he probably sank to the bottom like a sack of potatoes. By contrast, neither So nor Mitsumin are as, as heavily augmented as him. If they manage to make it off the ship in one piece, we might be able to find them by keeping a close eye on the water. Surrounded by the falling snow, we continue silently gazing out at the ocean. The flames ravaging the, ha the Hawaii are gradually extinguished by the waves as the ship's bow continues to sink into its watery grave. As dusk approaches, so too does the ocean take on an, on an ever darker hue. Before long, the stern of the sh ship vanishes into the murky depths below, leaving only some foam and bubbles to remind us that it even existed. In the end, we're left with nothing but the cold, dead ocean and the perpetual churning of its midnight waves. Mitsumin has no internal oxygen circulation device of her own, and even with Soen's oxygen supplies, it's unlikely he'll survive for long in waters this cold. My mind begins to accept that the two of them might already be. Iria's voice fades like a dying whisper, along with her, with her final glimmer of hope. Hoping to offer some comfort, I reach out and embrace her, while forgetting all about the state of my body. By the time I realize what I've done, it's already too late. That battle with Milgram messed my body up real bad. She can probably tell something's wrong, even through my armor. How am I going to explain th <gasps> All of a sudden, I spot something in the water. Well, that was, uh... Such a coincidence. Hey, I see that. I see that, CG. I stare at Mitsumi's limp body in utter disbelief. She... Doesn't have an internal oxygen circulation device? And yet she dove this far deep into the ocean just to deliver my weapons. Uh. 
I immediately pull her into my arms. Neither of us are heavily augmented, which should help us to float back up to the surface. It's going to be a long journey though. We've sunk quite deep. Mitsumi has been without oxygen for a while now. She won't make it back to the surface in time, which is why. I decide to cover her lips with mine. Reaching behind her floating locks to her... Reaching behind her floating locks to hold her in pl her head in place, I pull her, pull her as close as I can while making sure that no water enters her mouth. Her eyes flicker open. She gazes back at me in surprise. Driven by reflex, she meekly attempts to free herself from my hold, but lacks the strength to do it. I keep her in my embrace and pry her delicate lips open. In the frigid depths of the ocean, I feel a hint of warmth against my lips. Our bodies touch. My internal oxygen circulation device still works. There should be a relatively large amount of oxygen in the air that still remains in my lungs. I'm determined to give it all that to Mitsumi. As she continues to receive my oxygen, Mitsumi's mind begins to gradually clear up. Gone is her previous days and lifeless stare. She fiercely presses herself against me, returning my kiss with her own. Little by little, we continue to float up toward the surface while sharing each other's oxygen. Even as the icy waves envelop me, Mitsumi's warmth is the fire that keeps my soul alight. Locked in a firm embrace, I, I count every reassuring beat of her heart, while using all the strength I have left in my body to carry us back to the surface. It won't be long now. We're almost there. Mitsumi starts violently cuffing and gasping for air the moment we reach the surface. I too feel like I've just come back from the dead as the oxygen fills up my lungs. I probably could have held out for a little longer, but even still, nothing beats a lung full of fresh air. Mitsumi is still in my embrace. That would explain why she still continues to hold on to me. I scan our surroundings, but can't see any trace of the Hawaii. Of the Hawaii. Damn you! Why are you so difficult with some of these naming schemes? It likely sank to the bottom of the ocean in our place. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be anything we could grab onto nearby. Just as I'm about to start thinking of a way to get us out of this situation, I sense something large and heavy above us. Looking up, I see one of the Empire Energy Corps' gunships hovering in the air, and the two faces peeking through its window belong to none other than... <laughs> Ethica and Iria. <laughs> As Iria looks down at me from high up, from up high, I hate English, man! <laughs> Like I said, sometimes I say stuff before actually reading it because I know how to actually finish a sentence, but come on! Her smile beams a thousand times brighter than even the stars glittering in the evening sky above. We climb back into the gunship after pulling up Son and Mitsumena. I would honestly love to just fly all the way home to the agency, but since we're on an Empire Energy Corp gunship, I don't have much say in the matter. Besides, they might turn out to be more reasonable than expected. That's not to say I'm already viewing them as, a, as the good guys, mind you. Especially this Yamanuma dude. He doesn't exactly radiate hospitality. I kinda doubt he and I will be sharing some beers while singing Kumbaya anytime soon. I don't know what the hell is Kumbaya. According to Sone, he didn't even hesitate to shoot the dead body of one of his own, own men with a scavenger. To his credit though, I guess he was just acting rationally. You know, to prevent the corpse from turning into a living dead. In our line of work, knowing someone's core principles is always reassuring. You wouldn't want to entrust your life to someone who could, bear, who could start behaving erratically in the midst of battle. 
After contacting Ryoko and letting her know what's up, we agree to be taken to the Tokyo Mega Float. I also use one of the first aid kits of the SAD to patch up my wounds, including my broken leg. All it took was a smart cast and boom. This undead body sure has its advantages. Can you stop talking, Ethica? I want to drink some water, damn it. Huh? Why is this... green? I spot, spot a speck of light below us. I don't think I've seen this before. Oh, okay. Oh, the Tokyo Mega Float scene is actually the same. Okay. Okay, so... When we arrive to the Tokyo... Our, our first impressions of the Tokyo Mega Float is the same. But the events here should be way different now. Rabbit Punch is taken, and I get a nifty pair of stun cuffs on my wrists. Should I attempt to use a weapon, they're gonna detect it and send an electric shock through my body. It'll be a real pain in the ass to remove the ultramagnetic whip from my left arm, so I'm pretty lucky to be allowed inside like this. They gotta do what they gotta do. Safety comes first, after all. I make an audible gasp. There's a cylindrical water tank right in the middle of the of the entrance lobby. The glowing green liquid inside it illuminates the tank's surroundings. We actually already know this? I see. I've been wondering why the place had a distinctively green greenish look to it. I guess it's because of these water tubes. But man, these things stick out like a sore thumb. Maybe you can think of them as an avant avant-garde avant sort of thing. We get on an elevator that passes through one of the bigger flexible veins and head to the top floor. The elevator is surrounded by an artificial membrane and rises up through the vein like a bubble. The elevator surrounded by an artificial membrane and rises up. What? Okay, that makes sense. I was like trying to make uh, sense out of that sentence. It felt weird. Can't say I ever expected to be traveling like this, but here we are. I mentally prepare myself to be thoroughly questioned. I mean, we can't. We did kind of butt into an SAD operation on the ship. When we get to the top, though, I'm left completely bewildered by the person who ends up greeting us. Okay, this is also the same. I guess everything will be the same, including when Iria talks to Subcon at this point. It's just that past that, it's going to be different. And also, I don't think we have Kiri in this route, right? Once our meeting with the CEO has concluded, Mitsumi and I leave the Empire Energy Corp headquarters ahead of the others. We also don't have Tokitaka and Ryoko. The streets of the Tokyo Mega Float are clean, safe, and well-maintained. It feels like a completely different world compared to mainland, mainland Tokyo, owing in large part to the abundance of life material. The artificial membrane also helps in maintaining a habitual... habitable... Temperature inside the dome, allowing flora to prosper. We see lush, green trees lining the streets. The people we pass by are all well-dressed well and sport warm smiles. In order to make the best use of the limited amount of space on, on the mega float, the city operates on a shift system and does not differentiate between day and night. I feel like I already saw this before, but I guess it was in Ethica's perspective with, uh, with, you know, Kiri. Back in Shinjuku, most people would hesitate to even leave their homes at night. But here, we can afford to, afford to enjoy a peaceful stroll while admiring the local scenery. I honestly didn't expect to find her this welcoming. To average people like us, the sense of duty that seems to drive Sophia is something distant and difficult to comprehend. We have our hands full with daily survival and the need to provide for ourselves. In that sense, 
I can't help but feel a woeful lack of reality in Grand Grandiose. Grand Grandiose? How do you say that? <laughs> Concepts like the maintenance of global order and progress that she so fervently champions. And yet, I did find myself moved by the sheer sincerity of her appeal. Even our brief meeting was enough for me to tell how determined she is in her convictions. <laughs> Gazing out at the crowded cityscape, Mitsumi mutters a half sentence to herself. <laughs> Facing against adversity, I guess? That's something that you have to find for yourself the answer to? Don't ask me. I am momentarily taken aback by her somewhat philosophical questions. Mitsumi has always been endlessly earnest in her demeanor, in her very approach to life. Right now, that earnestness is tinged with defeat. Mitsumi casts her eyes toward the ground. Years ago, in that snow-caped forest of genetically engineered trees, we fought side by side against the suicide wannabes. Mitsumi lost her brother Sumihiko and swore to avenge him. She fought and killed the living dead with a fervor that would have easily broken a lesser woman, all for the sake of her revenge. And then, when she was a mere ha hair's breadth away from fulfilling her ambition, Milgram slipped through her grasp. Fallen victim to the relentless destructive power of the, of the Empire Energy Corps' railguns, he sank to the bottom of the ocean along with his ship. Milgram is gone. And yet so is the goal Mitsumi has dedicated her li entire life to. I struggle to find the right words. I mean, you can always find a new goal in life. A hollow gesture of sympathy would only end up hurting her. But I still feel a powerful urge to tell her something. To convey how I feel. Having said all that aloud, I finally realized something for the very first time. I've been fighting all my life for survival, but at the same time, I did nothing but kill. Seemingly realizing something, Mitsumi locks eyes with me. Slowly but surely, her expression blossoms into a smile. Thank <laughs> For a short while, I find myself unable to tear my eyes away from her. The sudden exclamation causes both Mitsumi and I to hastily look away from each other. Smiling ear to ear, Iria comes gleefully trotting up to us. Why are you the one blushing though, Iria? And just like that, Mitsumi takes off in a hurry. After we left, Iria stayed behind to discuss some of the currently undisclosed details about the Tokyo Rebirth project with Sophia. I do wonder why they need Iria's help to get the project off the ground. Even as she denies my allegation, 
Iria's expression nonetheless remains clouded over. She's not looking at anything in particular. Instead, she allows her gaze to wander. Following her example, I take a look around as well. The Tokyo Mega Float. Floating atop the waters of Tokyo Bay, its monumental domeless city, dome city glimmers in perpetual light. Its inhabitants' faces are as bright as its illumination. I take a moment to think. What turn would my life have, ta have taken had I been born in the city and not Tokyo? Where would I have lived? What kind of job would I have would I have held? And what sort of life would I have led? I can't even begin to imagine. I'm fairly certain I would not have been a living dead stalker though. According to Yamanuma, the primary source of employment, if you can call it that, for energy elites is an ac activity called city crafting. By controlling the growth of the lightweight and ultra durable life material, they build and craft the city as they see fit. The life material actually reacts to the rich richness of the citizens' emotions and alters the speed of its growth accordingly. The energy elites thus cont contribute to the advancements of advancement of mankind by creating a city that is brimming with life and humanity. Tokyo is teeming with danger at every corner. Day by day, we are forced to risk our lives. Being able to live peacefully in a city like this would be nothing short of a dreamlike opportunity. But would I really be content with that? Could I really get used to a way of life where I wasn't staring down death on a daily basis? Iria gently leans against me. I can feel her tiny, delicate shoulders trembling. Had Ethica been a citizen of the, of the Tokyo Mega Float? Had Ethica been a citizen of the Tokyo Mega Float, she would not have died. I guess we found out about this now. No amount of eco equivocation will change that fact. I have no idea what that word means. Iria's anguish and fear are more than valid. I can't deny them. Suddenly, Iria lets out a gasp. Her gaze seems to be searching for something. What's going on? Just as I'm about to ask her, I hear it. There are no speakers or anything similar around us. It could very well be a figment of my imagination. And yet... Iria pulls down her hood and stares in the direction the sound appears to be coming from. She's also hearing this. We set out to find a source of the music. She stands at the shores of a midnight ocean. Following her gaze, I fully grasp what's going on. We saw something similar back at the rooftop of the Ikebukuro CPC. But this place is magnitudes more beautiful. I nod. Iria's midnight shores. The scenery in her VR program was modeled after this beach. This beach that we couldn't actually get into in the, in the last two routes. Iria kneels down onto the snow white sand. I decide to join her and sit down myself. As a result of the artificial membrane surrounding the city, snow doesn't fall here in the mega float. Even the rolling waves are adjusted to be slow and gentle, unlike the raging sea outside. It's a world far removed from the daily life we're used to. A world I thought could only exist inside a VR program. And yet, here it is, right before my eyes. I've yet to hear the full details of the Tokyo Rebirth Project. But this is her choice, and hers alone. 
It is not my place or anyone else's to dictate how she leads her life. I must respect her wishes. ずっとこっちにいることになるのかな。うーん、そうだね。場所が場所だから頻繁にここは出られないだろうけど。君は君の未来に進む。その道筋が僕たちと違っていることも当然あるだろう。それは喜ぶべきことなのに。なのに。や
every day it gets just a little bit harder. Ohayo, Etsuka. Ohayo. Is Mitsumi with us? Doesn't look like it. We begin chowing down on Ryoko's homemade breakfast. The living dead require no food. Lamours take care of all our energy needs. But it's not like we're unable to eat. Without any maintenance, our bodies continue to wither away, which naturally includes our digestive system as well. But we're still capable of ingesting food. It tastes like nothing though. I swallow it anyway. Someone's gaze wanders to a seat that's remained cons conspicuously empty. Oh, I get it. Things aren't as lively around here without Iria. That would explain why everyone looks so bummed out. Hell, the fact that even I've noticed that should speak volumes. Man, my senses sure have dulled. I feel a little sad about it. Just a little though. <laughs> even Tokitaka, huh? The day we were taken to the Tokyo Mega Float, Sophia attempted to persuade Iria to help her. Apparently, her assistance would help save mankind from this accursed ice age we're living in. That convinced her, and she agreed to help. Iria's a grown woman. As such, we should respect her choices. I know that. But still, I kind of miss her. We all do. Man, were the bungling boys always this quiet? If only there was someone still sitting in that seat. Someone is visibly surprised. The person who walks in to join us at the table is... Mitsumin? The hell? あら。みんなには言ってなかったかしら。今日から私たち そもそもネクロマンサーの犯罪件数は減少傾向にあった。私たちだっていつまでも今の仕事を続けられるとは限らない。リビングデッドストーカーの新たな形を模索する必要があるの。New ways, huh? What does the future have in store for me, though? Our morning meeting finally comes to an end. Mitsumi might have joined us, but that doesn't mean we have any new cases on our hands. A whole week has gone by since the amphibious assault ship incident. We've been kept busy by constant questioning from the military police, as well as some additional cleanup work. They've been combing through the ocean to try and find Milgram's body. There have been no cases worthy of note in that time. Necromancer-related crimes might really be on, on, a, de on a decline. On a decline, there we go. At any rate, I have the day off. I'll take care of my daily training. But other than that, I have nothing planned. I might just head over to Kansu's place to get my MPP looked at and maybe watch a movie or two. Or perhaps... Oi, son. Hmm? <laughs> After Tokitaka whispers that into my ear, I turn around. I turn around again. She's not even looking my way. I don't get this. Thanks, Dogitaka. Thanks, Tokitaka. Thanks. 
なんだって Gijo Mitsumi is one of the top living dead stalkers in Tokyo. Her body needs to be in perfect condition for her, for her to do her job. Even the slightest abnormality could threaten her life on the battlefield. I hurry over to Mitsumi. Noticing my approach, Mitsumi's eyes start, to start darting left and right. What? Mitsumi. She must have been hiding her symptoms from us all this time. When I touch her arm, I can tell she's positively drenched in sweat. Her condition might be severe. Sure, Ryoko. Ryoko seems to have failed to grasp the severity of the situation, but I'll just have to explain it to her later. Should I have Mitsumi receive treatment at the military police's hospital? Or. Mitsumi has a closer look at my face. She does not seem to be aware of her symptoms. These guys are stupid, man. Mitsumi grabs me by the hand and starts running. Her palm being slippery can't just be from the fever. Having lost all composure, she was ready to run all the way to the doctor on foot, but I managed to calm her down and convince her to take a Quilicant. So now we're on our way by car. It takes a while for us to piece together what just happened. It would appear we both mistakenly thought that the other was sick. Huh? Someone's face was? I see. We were both just nervous. Even now, my heart's still beating a little faster than usual. I don't experience anything of this sort when I'm on a battlefield. I'm a little ashamed, to be honest. The reason should be pretty clear. As for what we ought to do now, well, that should probably also be pretty clear. No, Mitsumi. Mitsumi makes a sound I struggle to even describe. Sorry about that. Mitsumi nods. I think I did the right thing here. It can't hurt to spend a day off like this from time to time. Now that I think about it, I don't have anything planned, in fact. Ooh. Ooh, sorry about that. You guys probably heard that. That was my arm rest. Good question. I almost suggest watching some old movies at Kansu's place, but I immediately realized how bad of an idea that would be. Ethica likes to call me bungling, but even I'm not that clueless. I mean, we're about to go on a... Mitsumi. It should be fine. I walk around her and open the door of the car.
三つみどうしたすまないま待ってもらっていいか I did see something on the transition screen. I assume she's gonna change her clothes, right? Do you think? And just like that, she rushes off into her agency. As for me, I'm left alone by the car with nothing to do. I spend some time absent mindedly gazing at the clouds in the sky. I can't believe I just said that. A date. That's right. We're on a date right now. Going somewhere together for fun on a day off. What else would that be if not a date? Will I be able to live up to our expectations though? Will we manage to have fun together? I fought my fair share of deadly necromancers, but I've never felt as nervous as I do right now. Shut the fuck up, Zone. It's okay. I've already planned out where we'll go. It'll be fine. At least. That's what I desperately keep telling myself. Nagaoka, Kikoi Nainoka? Yeah, there we go. That was the, the thing I saw. I find myself at a loss for words. I've only ever seen Mitsumi in the, in the white bodysuit that she wears for combat. Seeing her like this feels strangely different. She looks so. feminine. As obvious as that sounds. Mitsumi's heart rate has, has escalated, making her cheeks a little flushed and rosy. I'm in the same boat. So, let's go. I'm momentarily taken aback by the fresh experience of hearing Mitsumi actually say my name. Well, this is a lot weirder compared to Ethica's ending. These two are a lot more awkward, in my opinion. Flustered, she hastily apologized for it. I immediately reassure her. Mitsumi makes a hearty nod. And with that, our date finally begins in earnest. The place we head to first is. Seriously? Amehoko is a crowded district where money changes hands almost every minute. So even with the remnants of the ex-US army keeping watch, crimes are bound to occur. That involves cases related to living dead as well, meaning it shouldn't be surprising for Mitsumi to come here for work. But that's but that she's never actually visited Amehoko just a shop is unusual to say the least. When doing any kind of shopping in Tokyo, most people would consider coming here first. We leave our call account at the parking lot. A massive smart material locks our tires in place. Mitsumi pours over the information plague, plaque, I point out to her. As most residents travel through Tokyo using the public taxi network, private cars are a bit of a rarity. Manual driving is considered to be a pastime of sorts meaning it's mostly the upper class who own them. Tokyo doesn't actually have too many parking lots. That's actually still true to, the, you know, in the current day too. Since they cater to the rich, they can get away with using something as expensive as smart material. Hmm. Mitsumi reads the important parts of the plaque out loud, making sure she understands everything. 
it's certainly like her to be meticulous. So. それで私たちは何をするんだ買い物だよ。何か不足でもいや、別に足りないわけじゃないけれど。えうん。では、なぜ買い物にいや、欲しいものがあるかなって。だが、不足はないのだろうないけど。ならば、買い物は不要では? でもほら、いろいろ店に並んでいるものを見たら、急にそれを買いたくなったり。I think you hang out with Iria a bit too much soon. She's kind of rubbing off on you. ならない。まいったな。Scratching my head, I take a quick look around the area. I spot a nearby jewelry stand. えっと、例えばこのホロペンダントとか。欲しくないかな。いらん She certainly doesn't mince words. It's going to make it difficult to pick out a present for her. The mood between us isn't exactly lively either. Although I realize how that sounds coming from me. As I'm pondering how to handle things. そのたびにそう思い出す。心が見られる。そんな思いをするのは嫌だ。そうか。何を言わせるんだ。Her embarrassment kicks in with a slight delay. This is too awkward even for me, man. I should probably give up on trying to find her a present. But then what should I do? Hmm. Well, if she doesn't enjoy shopping, maybe we could... So, what? Hmm? Following Mitsumi's gaze, I notice a small ring surrounded by a cheering crowd of enthusiastic onlookers. It's <laughs> Mitsumi belongs to, to the Atai school. She may live away from the dojo, but that hasn't dulled her enthusiasm for martial arts one bit. She continues to train regularly. What's more, these matches usually involve a richly diverse pool of fighters, which leads to all sorts of different styles and schools duking it out against, duking it out against each other. Mitsumi's interest is perhaps to be expected. ただし、I'm trying to listen to the background like uh sounds. Yeah, that guy is actually speaking in English. Mitsumi hesitates a moment before answering. Did you actually plan to join in? We spent some time watching the matches. Despite not betting any money, we probably observed the fights more carefully than anyone else around around us. Someone attempted to start something with Mitsumi, but I stepped in and put an end to it. I do actually have a bit of a reputation around these parts. I've never been fond of being in the spotlight, but at times like this, it helps to be known as the as an elite living in Death Stalker. Then again, they probably just associate me with Ikatsu. He used to frequent this place. なかなかすごい試合だったな。ああ。確かに、ケンさんは積んでいるようだった。戦う覚悟もある。こんなところで真剣勝負が見られるとは思わなかった。だが。All of a sudden, Mitsumi's expression clouds over. そうのような美しさはないな。え? Am I hearing that correctly? 僕が。no one's ever told me something like that before. I don't know, I think Milgram has said that before. Now that I think about it though, I do recall Mitsumi worrying about the beauty of her technique. 
She didn't use words like skilled or, or precise. She went for beautiful. Tokitaka occasionally, or rather, quite frequently, extols the beauty of numbers. Perhaps she meant something more like elegant. This is the first time I've heard this BGM, by the way. More. I'm not going to pretend I can fully and accurately comprehend everything she's just told me, but I am happy that she feels this way. Those chestnuts? Mitsumi continues staring fixedly at, at the bag I just handed her. Her expression is beyond serious. What is she waiting for? I take one out of out from my bag. I pop it into my mouth and confirm that the taste is indeed as good as I remember it. No trip to Amehoko is complete without these. So, Mitsumi mo. Wana de wa nai no da na. Wana. どうしてうん。むしろ she must have really gotten, like, involved in a very bad, you know, experience with money or something. I have to feel a little sorry for Mitsumi. She's clearly not used to receiving acts of kindness from other people. She's faced with, she's faced the hardships of this world alone with only her undead brother at her side. In order to survive and make a living for herself, she needed to be ever wary and vigilant. Still, I do think she's overdoing it a little. So, she resolutely pops a chestnut into her mouth. You good? And starts chewing on it on it in silence. Mitsumi flashes a beaming smile. She easily could have just said it was delicious, even if it was a lie. But the fact she didn't is what makes Mitsumi who she is. What a weird girl. And then there's these two. What makes me who I am? It's been on my mind ever since I started losing my emotions. What did my past self do at times like this? How did I behave when I still had my had all my feelings? For once, the answer is clear. On days off when I had nothing else to do, I'd go see Kiri. I'm pretty sure about that. Do I let her know I'm coming? Nah. That would just ruin the surprise. I'd act on impulse and go see her right away, but not before getting her a thoughtful gift first. Hello? Oh, 
Kiri's eyes widened in surprise. It's been a week since we went to the Tokyo Mega Float. Things have finally calmed down for us at the agency, and it looks like Kiri's more or less in the same boat. I'm sure she's had to deal with a lot more than we did, though. Man, I actually don't know how much left is in this uh, route right now. I feel like I should go through with the with at least this event, but I'm actually not sure. I'm I'm really just being cautious because of what happened in the first ride I did, man. <laughs> this game is just a lot longer than I thought, you know. I think after this scene, I'm gonna call it an episode, though. Her hair is a little disheveled too. Did she pull another all nighter? Etchka-chan, what? 今日はお休み。昼ね、大変だろうなって思って。はい、お土産。I I hand over a bottle with some flavor capsules inside. Lotus flavored. Kiri's favorite. あ、嬉しい。いつもありがとう、ヘチカちゃん。いいえ、いいえ、どういたしまして。今忙しかった? I wiggle my pinky and pretend to tug at it at an invisible string connecting us. Kerry too plays along and acts like the string attached to her pinky has been pulled. We both end up smiling. Pretty good pair, huh? Kiri cuts herself off mid-sentence. Normally, she'd invite me to go have lunch. If we're gonna go anywhere together, it's gotta be here. The Ueno Botanical Garden. We take a stroll down a forest path in the artificial sunlight. It makes me feel bad that Kiri has to go out of her way and pretend not to see the nearby ice cream stand. But I'll play along. I turn a blind eye and stretch my arms out wide. <sighs> Kiri makes a dispirited nod, which kind of saps my enthusiasm as well. She's probably realized that I'm forcing myself to act the way I used to in life, which only ends up coming off as unnatural. Well, of course she would. We knew each other like the back of our hands. God, this sucks. I'll just get bummed out by every little thing at this rate. This would be a lot easier if I were more like Soen. Anyway, I need to get my act together. I address Kiri in a cheery tone. あれだよね。大人になるとさ、こういうのって難しいよね。こういうの遊ぶって言うとさ、何して遊ぶって話になって。True? <coughs> I lie down on the grass. Ever so faintly, I can smell the scent of lotus flowers in the air. The earth warms my back. As I look up at the sky beyond the ceiling glass, it's clouded over. The falling snow melts in the steam of the hot pipes. White snowflakes continue to trickle down from above, only to vanish in the blink of an eye. <laughs> ゴロゴロしたり。そういうのでよかったよね。じゃれあって、おしゃべりするだけでよくて。だよね。うん。ああ、芝生に寝たのって久しぶり。Kiri <sighs> comes over and lies down next to me. She silently gazes up at the sky. But she's not looking for anything in particular. She's just letting time pass. 
チカちゃん何キリネってつないでいい<笑>キリネ何エチカちゃん強化しよう I flash a white grin. It comes out natural, I think. Yeah, I think I did a pretty good job there. I sounded just like a living person. It's what Kiri's reaction tells me. I gotta get this stuff down pat to make sure I don't hurt those around me so I can keep on behaving like I used to. I hold Kiri's hand in mine. It's warm. She's so close. Kiri hesitates a moment, then finally speaks up, keeping her eyes glued to the sky above. The sky is still clouded over. I'm relieved to hear my own voice shaking. If only this moment could last forever. Well, that was pretty sad. And I don't know what the hell you guys are going to be doing, but I think I'm going to call it an episode right here. There's probably not much left, but I feel like I could still make into make this uh, into an hour video for the finale of this part. Because this feels, uh, you know, just like the end of the route, right? Though there's not really much going on in terms of this, uh, the actual story. Not much happened with Subcon. But I feel like this is actually a pretty happy route. Other than Etika dying, has anyone else actually died? Other than, you know, like the antagonists? I don't think so, right? Milgram, we are not sure if Milgram died. Pavlov is still alive, that's for sure. Olga's dead. Juichiro's dead. And then, yeah, I think that's about it. Not many people died actually in this route. But we do hear a lot about um, Mitsumi's story, though, and that is pretty nice. Though if I have to choose between Mitsumi or Iria, I probably would still choose Iria. But it's not like she's a bad character or anything. I think I just prefer Iria because um, she suits Soen a lot more, you know? Their dynamic is a lot better. But yeah, I don't know how much left is in the route, but I will have to... Cut this episode short. But next time, we will be finishing up this finishing up this route. And hopefully nothing sad happens to Ethica or something. Because after the last route, I I'm kinda attached to Ethica, you know? But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Give this video a like if you guys like it. Sub if you guys haven't. Patreon to be getting these episodes early access. Along with everything uncensored. Though, like I said. This game is not really for the arrow content. There's barely any arrow content throughout the whole... How many hours I played? 50 hours I played of this. But yeah, with that, I will see you guys next time.